Hey, good morning, Discovery. Make some noise if you're excited to be in God's church. Come on. Amen. Amen. Welcome everyone who's joining us online as well. So glad that you are here. Help me welcome everyone tuning in with us right now live. Come on, guys. Let them know that we're thankful they're coming along for the, for the journey. We're concluding our series, Perfect Peace, today. This is part six. So missed any of them, you can always check them out online or on YouTube. Today, you guys, I've been praying for you all week. Um, I feel like I have this, I've been carrying a burden all week because there, oftentimes the Lord will like show me, I feel like I can see some things going on and it causes me, it allows me to pray for you very specifically and intentionally. And I've been praying very intentionally over this conclusion of our series, probably going to be one of the most challenging of, of the six total messages in this series of perfect peace. Isaiah 26 and 3 is a challenging verse in and of itself because in it we learn that God has for us a perfect peace. He's got, he's got peace for us. If we, he says if we trust him and fix our thoughts on him, like it doesn't matter what's happening around us, that there we'll be able to possess and hold on to a perfect peace. Now it's Christmas week. How many of y'all excited for Christmas? Amen. <laughs> I mean, I'll stress out, and hopefully your shopping's done. <laughs> I am so sorry if it's, if it's not, but I thought today we conclude with this thought of peace as it relates to our Christmas story and, and how um, what we even celebrate on Christmas has a lot to do with peace. So let me go with you to Luke chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, to a, a scripture reading that often finds itself in Christmas services. It says this, um, suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Now, it's been quoted very many times. Charlie Brown, probably if you grew up on Charlie Brown, that's one you probably know because he quotes it uh, in, in their, in their you know, cartoons. Uh, but it's very misquoted as well. A lot of people, they quote that verse, and they don't say on earth peace. They say peace on earth. Now, how in the world can you have peace on earth in the world that we live in that is so chaotic and dysfunctional and challenging? How do we have peace on earth? I actually went and did a, a study of this phrase. Oftentimes when I'm studying the, the scriptures and, and, and you know, preparing to to preach and teach here for you guys, I'll, I'll often study, if it's a topic like peace, I'll read like every verse and everything that has to do with peace around that topic. And I just spend a lot of time studying and soaking in what God's word has to say about peace. Well, this week what I did was I studied the phrase peace on earth. Just see, like, like what does God have to say about peace on earth? This is hilarious, you guys. I only found one occurrence of that phrase in the entire Bible, all translations, only one time is mentioned, peace on earth. I put it in your notes, Luke chapter 12, verse 51. Jesus said, do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No. Merry Christmas, everybody. God bless you. <laughs> There's your Christmas card verse. There you. Actually, he goes on. He's like, you think I came to bring peace? No, 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 no. Actually, I came, he said, to bring division, like, okay, so what he's, what he's talking about here is that this gospel actually does divide people. It, it, it absolutely does. It's not that he wanted to come and cause turmoil. The result, though, of this gospel was there's going to be sheep and goats. There's going to be some who believe and some who do not believe. And so my question to date to you is, <laughs> if there is no such thing as peace on earth, and Jesus corroborates that. Like, like, no, actually, there's division. That's actually what I came to bring. I came to, to bring the dividing line of who are mine and who are not, who are lost and who are found, who are my children, the children of God and children of the, of the devil. Who are like, this is, this is what, like, I didn't come to bring peace. I actually came to actually make something very, very clear. Okay? So, so how do we find peace on, or is, is that a, a available? Um, and the reality is, there is not peace on earth. That's not the promise. The promise is not peace on earth. The promise is on earth peace. Like what, what, what that means is even though this earth is messed up, even though problems and challenges and trials on this messed up earth, God says, I have peace available for you. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, 
that, that even though this world is messed up, he still wants us to not just possess peace, but to influence peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. For those are the ones who are actually my children. Those are the ones who are children of God. The title of today's message is Peace on a Dividing Earth, on a Divided Earth. How do we have peace on an earth that is very divided? Over the 3,500, over 3,500 years of recorded history, if you add in biblical history, it'd be about 6,000 years, but recorded history books, like 35, over 3,500 3, years of recorded history, there has been 14,351 wars on, in that time. And, and in that time, there has been 3.6 billion, billion people died by war. 3.6 billion people died in wars. Over that course of recorded history, there has been 8,000 peace treaties on this earth among groups and people. How many of them do you think lasted? Not a single one have lasted, okay? Uh, so how, how do, this earth cannot bring you peace. Only God can bring peace. So the question is, where do we lose our peace then? How do we, you know, why aren't we peaceful people? You know, the answer is very simple. People. Because <laughs> people, we're, we're just, we're terrible. People are terrible. How I many of you have, like, you have a great day, you're having a great day, everything's going good. You could be on the top, you could have been hearing from God, but just one sideways look from the wrong person. Wrong, one comment coming at you at the wrong direction, you know what I mean? Just all the joy that God gave you in that moment, all the peace can just be in a moment gone because of people, right? I actually, years ago, years ago, I was in my office doing some study. I was preparing to speak and preach on a topic, and this scripture, this specific scripture just hit me, and I, I just, it was, I stopped studying, I began to just cry and worship, I turned on some worship, and I just sat in this scripture that was just ministering to me greatly, and I just, for the, for, until it was time to go, it was already late in the day, but I just was worshiping God in my office, and had the worship music on, and I just left my office just feeling like, wow, God is going to gonna move like he was moving in me already and I get into my car and I turn on some more worship and I, I'm worshiping in the car man until I get on the freeway and I get on the freeway and, and emerge onto this freeway I'm in the far right lane and slowing because I just merged on it and and this truck comes up like right up on me I'm talking about you couldn't even put a piece of toilet paper between the bumpers he was like so close and, and I wish I could tell you that I am holy all the time. And I always respond in very, very, like, I always get it right. I wish I could tell you. I always get it right. I wish I could tell you in this story, I was like, go ahead, my brother and sister. God bless you. Let me just, let me just pull over, get out of the way. I wish I could tell you that. But that's not what happened. I was just in a moment, having a moment with God. And this dude, I could see him in the rearview mirror, like, like peering over, like I did something wrong. And I look at my rear view like, what? what I do? But, I, but I'm not even, I'm not even like really saying it because he can't hear me. So I'm just lipping. I'm all, you know, don't act like you've never done that. You're like lipping it to the rear view mirror. And, and I'm like, what is this guy's problem, man? And, and so I, I, I'm, again, there's open lanes in the left. They're open. And he's up on my, I'm like, he must like the slow lane or something. Let me just get, finally, let me just get over. But as I get over and like, let him pass, I'm like, I'm gonna look at this dude in his eyes and let him know. I'm about to let him know. I did not like this, okay? The worship music is still on, by the way, okay? And I'm like, he, he comes by, and it's, he comes and pulls up next to me and slows down, and it's a church member. And he's laughing at me. <laughs> I got you, pastor. Messed up. I tried to play it off. I'm like, ah, just joking, bro. I'm just joking. He got me, though. He got me. I was not joking. I was not okay. It just goes to show you just what, like how, how quick, right? Don't act like, you, like you've had that. You've been on a good moment, peace, and then it just, in a, in a snap, just like you could just get, get off course so quickly. David actually wrote this entire Psalm, Psalm 120, about how people could just get him sidetracked and turn him sideways so quickly. The whole Psalm is about it. Let me just give you two verses. Psalm 120, verse 6 and 7. David goes, too long, God. By the way, he's singing this. These are all songs. Like He's like, this is a song. He's singing, too long, God. Have I lived among people who hate peace? He said, here I am, a man of peace. 
But these people all around me, when I speak, all they want is war. I don't know if you ever felt that way. I don't know if you ever felt like, man, I, I live among, amongst a co-workers who don't want peace. All they want is war. Like, all, all they want to do is stir up stuff. Just stir up stuff, man. I live among a, or, or if you feel like, man, here I am. I'm trying to have peace and stuff, but I live amongst a family in a family that just does not know how to have peace, who just wants to stir stuff up. We live in a world and in a nation who just does not, like they can't get anything done. They just are hating people, hating each other. So much division and hate. Like, here I am. Here we are. Men of peace, women of peace. We want peace, but we're living in a world that's just full of war. <laughs> what, do you, what do we do when, when people around us, like you want peace, but other people around you don't want it. And so what, what you probably want me to do in a message like this is teach you conflict resolution, but that's not what we're doing today, okay? Because um, there's a time and place for that. And the Bible does give you some really good skills and tools and gifts in here. The Bible, can, like we can apply to, to have kind of when there is conflict and war between two parties or d d division between two parties, we come together and kind of work that out. I'm not gonna, I'm not, that's not what we're talking about today. Today, I'm gonna assume we never get along. I'm going to assume, like, because, like, for, like, in 3,000 years, we've had four wars on average every year, most of them lasting for more than a year. So we're constantly at war. Someone said peace is the glorious moment in history where everybody stops fighting to reload. So the question is, since this is a peace series, can we have peace anyway? Like, even if we never do get along. Even if, even, if, even if your family never does, figure it out. Even if your, your boss becomes more demanding. Even if, like, like even, even if, can, can we still, when people around us, the people who, who so easily can rob us of our peace and rob us of our joy, can we still have peace even when people around us want conflict and war? And I'm going to show you how today. I'm going to show you that possibly you've been surrendering your peace to people and, and unknowingly you've been blaming the people around you why you don't have peace. And, and today I want to equip you. I want to, I want to give you some, some tools how even if they never come around, how you can still have your peace. Does that sound like good news for you guys? You want, you want some of that? Okay. First, let me show you the progression of conflict because conflict, when you do have, when people are at us and there's conflict and there's word and there's division, it usually follows this progression. And I want to show you the progression that our conflict takes. And I like to show you the progression a lot. Like I'll give you stages and progressions and stuff like that because I want you to be able to see it, to identify the progression in your own life so that maybe you can go, oh wait, I know this. I can, I can stop this right Here's what that is, and let me put a stop to the progression before it gets any further and any worse. So let me give you, if there is conflict between in, in your life, it usually follows the same progression. Write these down. It starts here. Number one is distance. It starts with distance, a distance of thought, a distance of ideas, a separation of some kind. This happens in our marriages sometimes. This happens in our, in our kids and in, in family. I think one way, you think another way. It's a distance, not a geographical or physical distance. We don't, but way before you physically distance yourself from that person, if you really think back, you distance yourself in your heart and mind first. Like there was like, like we just, we just do, we're just different. We're too different. And like you have this distance inwardly. And, and if you don't handle that distance that you have, like the distance of thought, of attitude, of heart, if you don't handle that the right way, which most people don't, most people don't know how to deal with the distance that we're feeling. And because we don't deal with it in a healthy way, then it always will lead to this second stage, which is walls, which we fill the gap and the space with just these. Some of you are here today and you built walls around your heart. You said, you know, no one's going to treat me that way again. I'm not going to let that happen to me again. And really what happened in the distant stage was something triggered and you picked up on something, you pushed someone back and you, you kind of said, let me just put up those walls just a little bit higher because uh, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be taken advantage of again. That ain't going to happen to me again. I'm not going to be abused or mistreated or, or feel that way again. And so you think there's this protective mechanism that you have from people accessing or, or hurting you. And some of you have a wall between you and others. Some of you, listen to this, some of you got a wall between you and God. 
because God didn't do what you thought he was going to do when you thought he should have did it. So you kind of just, okay, man, because I can't, get, can't trust him as much as I did trust him before because he didn't do it that time. So I'm just going to, the, the relationship isn't what it used to be. You have a distance of what you thought he should do and what actually happened and you didn't deal with the distance between and so what happened is a wall between you and God developed are you seeing this you guys this is just any conflict any confliction between between parties and people will usually follow this progression it'll start with some distance and then it will develop some walls and if you don't deal with the walls it'll always develop into escalation have you ever been there where the argument just escalated like it started very simple which it always amazes me when I'm talking to people and, and you know, married couples and, and, and like what they're really arguing about is like so, and sometimes we don't even remember where the argument started because we escalated this thing so far. You're like, what are we arguing about? Because we've just like escalated this thing so much. It's, it's, it's now bigger. We made something bigger than what it originally was. This is the danger zone of conflict. This is, uh, this is where you're almost at a tipping point when you're at this escalation place because when you're making something bigger than it actually is, you're using your imagination in a very negative way. You're magnifying something. You're, you're like, um, you're, you're exaggerating almost something. And, and so this is, you, you're beginning to believe a lie, which is, by the way, the devil's primary tool is a lie. And I've, you've heard me say this before. When, when you believe the lie, you empower the liar. So here you are. If you do not deal, if you continue to escalate and make things bigger than they are, it's the dangerous place. Now the enemy is about to get involved in, in your life. Now you're opening a door for the devil in your life. Here's the next stage, false belief. Now you're in the devil's playground. Now you're believing things that are not true. You're believing things about her or him that are not true, about them that are not true. You've made decisions in your mind because of the distance, the walls, and the escalations. You've actually come to conclusions that God is not in agreement with you with. You actually are in agreement with the devil. False belief. We're in this place of, of, of just believing something that is not true. This is, it is very dangerous. It's dangerous because, because um, some people will even... You try to help someone that's at this stage, and it's even hard to help them because they don't see it, huh? Have you ever been to that place where you're trying to, like, someone is, is it, they're just, they believe something, and they're convinced of it, and it's not true, and you're trying to help them, and it's hard to help them because they're so convinced. And sometimes, if, they're, if, if it happens in, in the church or amongst brothers and sisters, sometimes people that get to this place, they even use Scripture to back up their false belief. And what a twisted place, right? The enemy uses scripture too. He, he can use it really well, okay? And so, and, and if you don't deal with this, if you don't deal, and this is now hard because now you're believing the, the wrong stuff, it's hard now to, to get out of that place of, of darkness and false belief when the enemy has now gotten access to your mind and your imagination. But if you don't, if you don't deal with it, it leads to this next stage, what I, which I call hostility. Hostility. And this is just basically, now I'm upset. Now I'm upset. I'm, I'm mad. I'm, I'm, I'm angry. Here's the interesting thing about hostility. This is so huge, you guys. Hostility is not the emotion that you feel toward the other person. Listen, hostility becomes the condition of your own soul. This is so huge, you guys. Because now, literally, that person that you thought that you were punishing with your distance and your imagination and your, you're just like mad at them and stuff like that, you thought you were punishing them, but actually what happened is you caused them to allow you to have no peace within yourself. And a lot of times, you're not even at peace with God at this stage. You're just hostile on the inside. And some of you are here today and you're in hostility, like inward hostility. And here's how I would ask the question for you to discover it. Are you at peace with your soul? Is your soul at peace? Are you at rest in your soul? See, a lot of us, it's not. David, not in your notes, but he prayed another prayer. He said, why so disturbed within me, O oh, my soul? You know, he's like, put your hope in God. And the reason why he said that is because he couldn't get there. It was hard for him to get there. He's like, he didn't want to feel this way. He didn't want to be all like messed up on the inside. But people mess him up so much. He's like, come on, man. Put your hope in God. He was just so disturbed from within himself. Could it be today that you're here disturbed on the inside? Hostile. On the inside of you. 
And by the way, if, if you are, if you're feeling this, if you're like, man, I see this progression, this message is for you today, man. You are in the right place. Finally, though, if you don't deal with hostility, it leads to just all-out war. War, and I'm talking about war, you guys. Are you ready for this? Some of you are at war with yourself. Some of you are at war with other people. And here's the deal. I'm going to confront you right now. Don't get mad at me, but I need to, we need to hear the truth of this, okay? If you're not at peace within your soul, then the reality is you are not at peace with God, okay? And, and it's not, you know, fun to hear, but, but in, if you're not at peace in your soul, then, then you're not at peace with God, then that, then that probably means that there are some things in your life that are not submitted to the authority of God's word. Because in that moment that I was feeling so hostile and angry when I should have prayed for them, when I should have loved them, when I should have been merciful to them, when I should have, when I should have displayed some other fruit, in that moment, I, I actually had some things in my life that were not submitted to God. They weren't. And it's this constant act of your will and obedience to, to do so. Let me show it to you in the scripture. James chapter 3. Look at this verse. It's it's an important verse. It kind of slams us all just a little bit. James chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. He says, if you harbor, and that's a key word right here, like if you hold on to bitterness, envy, selfish ambition in your hearts, look what he says. Do not boast about it. Like I had the right to, pastor, because you don't know how they treated me. Trust me, they're wrong. Not me. I didn't do this. He says, no, don't boast about it. Or look at this. Deny truth. I'm about to give you today three truths that are really going to help you, give you some freedom in this area. But inevitably, I don't want this to be the reality, but, but I think, and I hope it's not true, but, but some of you might leave here today going, I can't do that. I can't go there. And, and I can't do those things. Ah, I, can't, I can't go there with them. Yeah. Those people? Mm-hmm. And, and when you do that, here's what you're doing. You're denying the truth. You're rejecting God's peace that he has made available to you and you're denying truth. And here's what he says about that. Such wisdom, and he calls it that because we think we're making the right decision. We think we're right. We're we're right, we're wrong, we're right. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven. Instead, it is an earthly. Look what he says. It's unspiritual and it's of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. So what do we do, you guys? How do we settle the war within? Listen to me closely, you guys. This is what Jesus came to do. This is the Christmas message here. He came to bring peace. That's, that, that was his mission. That is now what is available to every single one of us. Look what it says in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ without hope, without God in the world. But now, someone say, but now. In other words, like now, once you receive Jesus, things have been changed. Let me say it this way. If you're here today and you're like, you've given your life to Christ and you prayed that prayer, but you didn't have a but now moment, you didn't, nothing's changed in your life, you probably didn't receive Jesus. Because for those who receive Christ, there is a but now moment. See, here, I'm preaching 63% better than you're responding right now, and you guys are not there with me, okay? So, because when you do, when you, when you fully surrender your, your life to God, there is a change and a transformation. There is a but now moment. It says this, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. He is the prophetic, the prince of peace, almighty God, everlasting father. When you meet God, you meet peace. Who has, now look what he's done here. He doesn't just bring peace between you and him. It says, who has, he makes everything, the two, one. Paul was trying to settle this, in this book, between in in, in the Ephesians book, the, the, the argument between Jews and Gentiles And he says, look, there should be no fighting between you two because in Christ, he makes the two one. And he has destroyed the barrier, look what he calls it, the dividing wall of hostility. So how do we do this, you guys? Here's here's the, the question today that I would like to help answer. How do we be peacemakers in a crazy world? How do we have peace when when other people just want conflict? 
What if they, and what if they never actually come around? What if they never have a light bulb moment? What if they actually never come and apologize and see the light? What if they, what if it never, what if we never get along? How do we still have peace in a world and around people that don't want peace? They actually want war. They actually want to see you fall. They actually want harm on you. They're actually believing things and still gossiping about you today. How in the world do we have peace when they want war? Three things, and you got to buy into them. I'm telling you, God's word is true. If you buy into these three things, it doesn't matter what they do or don't do. You can have peace, okay? Here it is. Number one, you got to receive God's forgiveness, okay? Now, I say that, and some of you are like, okay, great, check. Number two, pastor, I'm ready. I'm ready. Here's what I've learned about Christians. Some, there's, I think there's a lot of Christians who, who have, I mean, they're saved, but you just haven't received a full revelation of what your forgiveness is. You just haven't like been fully, you don't fully understand what God has done. Like you know God and you love God, but somewhere down the line, like you've still re- you received God's forgiveness, but like you, and you still pray for forgiveness. You still say you're sorry, but you find yourself at times trying to earn God's forgiveness. And here's how I can prove it. Sometimes you come in here into church reminding yourself of the week that you had, of the thing that you said and you shouldn't have said, the feelings you felt and you wish you didn't feel, the thoughts, the, 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 the should haves and could haves, like, oh, man. And, and so when, what happens is you come in here with that, with that memory, with that on your shoulders, and you kind of have your tail tucked under a little bit. And when the time is worship and we're praising God and stuff, and although inside you really want to praise God, you're like, no, nah, I'm not going. I'm not, I just can't. I just can't go there today, you know, because I just feel, oh, I just too, oh, man, I know. Or, or maybe you go, oh, I just shouldn't even serve on the team anymore. I just done messed up. I shouldn't have done that. And, I, and, and so you're, you're, you're convincing yourself that, that, that you're not worthy somehow. And like, as if God was keeping score or keeping a record. So we come in with our tail tucked under. Yeah, God, I, I messed up this week. And we have an unhealthy view of God. And what you need to know is that God knew what you did before you ever did it. And he chose to love you, forgive you anyway. Like, his forgiveness is for you, your past, your present, and your future, and he loves you anyway, regardless of what you, like, he forgives you completely for everything, 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 and that changes when you understand that, you really grasp the love and the forgiveness of God, it changes everything about how you see yourself, how you relate to God, how you treat other people. It changes when you understand the Apostle Paul, not in your notes, but in Ephesians chapter 3, he actually prayed this prayer over the, the Ephesian church. He said, I, I pray that your eyes would be enlightened, that you would see the height, the depth, the breadth, the width of the amazing, extravagant love of God, that if you would grasp this, it just would change the way that you're relating to people and the conflict that you're having. Because when you try to receive, here's what's happening. When you try to receive forgiveness from God, you try to earn it, you make other people people try to earn your forgiveness. Remember how he forgave you. Look at this sentence on the screen. You'll never have to forgive anybody more than God has already forgiven you. In other words, it's nothing compared to the amount of love and grace that God has shown to you and to me. And when I really understand this and I really receive this, it changes the way that I'm going to treat people and I react and interact with people that hurt me. 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul talks about this. He says, even though I was once a blasphemer, he's like, I was the worst. I was, I was the worst. I, I'd swear and curse God and defy God. I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor. I killed Christians, man, and violent men. And even though I was all that, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord, check out this this verse here. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. I want you to grasp what this verse just said. That God 
poured out abundantly upon the apostle Paul. He's saying, man, I want you guys to know that God poured out onto me faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. You know what that means? That means he's saying this, that even though I was jacked up and I messed up and I was doing the wrong things for the wrong reasons and I was so far, God not only forgave me, God not only wiped me clean, God not only purified me entirely, but he actually believed in me. He put his faith in me. He said, not only am I going to forgive you, son, but I can still use you to make a difference. I can still do something in your life that is significant, that is powerful. He doesn't hold that against me. He doesn't hold that against you. So he said, here's a trustworthy saying, and it deserves full acceptance, meaning Paul's going, I want you to, hey, I want you to grab this. It's one thing for it to be in, in the scripture and me to just preach this to you or you to read this or me to write this letter to you guys, but I want you to accept it. Don't just read it. It deserves your full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save you. All of us were the worst, than, worse than the issues that you're still holding on to from other people. For the worst of sinners, he said, of whom I am the worst. When you grab that, wow, what he, what he did for me that, that I escaped this punishment, this this, this penalty that I don't have to pay, the love that was shown, that on top of that, he didn't just excuse it and cleanse it and purify it and forgive it. But he looked at me and he said, Jason, I can still use you. I can still use you, even though you were jacked up, man, even though you made some, some stupid decisions. I can still use you to do something significant with your life. And this is one of the things I just love. I love, love, love about God. I love about the Bible is that, is that God chose to use people that were so messed up, that were so like, that were just like, you know, like Paul said, he's the worst, the worst guy. Everyone's like, this guy, this guy is the worst. This is the worst guy. God chooses to use people like us just to show off his, his, his extravagant love. His, ex, his extravagant grace and forgiveness. And when you grab hold of what God has done for you, that you don't have to come and beg and earn it, but he's got it for you. It changes everything. It changes. And some of you are like, well, I haven't. I don't know that. It's available to you. Let me read Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Here's what he says. God says this, come now. Like, Let's, let this be the day that it's settled once for all. Let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, tr- stop trying to earn it. Stop trying to deserve it, serve more, do more, all this. Stop, receive it. He goes, I will make them as white as snow. Though your sins are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool if you will only obey me, if you only buy into my plan and you would submit. I think this is the reason why we have oftentimes trouble forgiving others is because we've never really truly grasped the forgiveness of God. That living your life this way, again, when you, when you try to earn God's forgiveness, you don't have this, this understanding, you're going to make other people try to earn forgiveness from you. But when you receive what God did and you have this understanding a full revelation of forgiveness and his love, it changes everything. Now I have the capacity to do number two, which by the way, don't try to do number one or don't try to do number two if you haven't done number one because you don't have the power or capacity to actually give yourself peace and finish this progression here of, of number two. You don't have it yet unless you do number one. But when you do number one, you can do number two, which is this, freely give now what you've received. Now I can freely give because step one has given me capacity to do this next step. And I personally believe that this is the missing ingredient. This is why it's so hard for us to forgive and the reason why we don't forgive. The reason why we think uh, we need to form a meeting and then I got to get them to compromise and let's just seek to understand. And if I could just, if I could just convince you of my argument in my way, we would just come to some kind of, and there's a time and place for that. But, but I'm saying like, what if that never happens? What if they never agree with you? What if not only do they not want to agree with you, but they want conflict with you? Do you hold your forgiveness back then? Do we hold it? No. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 8, freely you have received, freely give. Jesus is saying, I didn't make you earn it. 
I didn't make you do anything for this. I didn't ask anything in return from you for this. I never asked anything. I didn't ask you to apologize first. I just went ahead and settled it. I just did it. Freely you have received, freely give. And that's why the motto of people of God should be this, the forgiven forgive. The forgiven forgive. You want to know how to forgive? This would be the sentence of the day, the forgiven forgive. Look at this scripture, this next scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's about this statement, the forgiven the forgive, where Paul just reasons with some people who would give some pushback to this lifestyle. 2 Corinthians 5 says this, for Christ's love is the fuel on the fire, is what he says. Christ's love compels us. It's what motivates us. The fact that he loves us so much is what compels us to do something that seems illogical because we are convinced that one died for all. Now we're talking about Jesus, but then he says this, and therefore all died. Wait a second, more people died than Jesus? Whoa, 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 <laughs> hold on here. Yeah, yeah, no, no, he's, he's talking about what happens inside of us, that he died for all, that those who live, that's us, should no longer live for themselves. That We actually die to ourselves. What, what does that mean? That means that he died for your best interests, so now you die for his best interests. That what he did for you, you can now reciprocate and do for others. It continues, but for him who died for them and was raised again. All this is from God who reconciled us. This, that word reconcile, it's actually a, an accounting term. It, reconciliation means to bring the balance to zero. When you reconcile accounts, like when you reconcile accounts, what you're doing is you're bringing the balance to zero. This is what God did. God took all of our debts, all of our penalties, all of our payments, all what we owed, and he brought it to zero. He canceled it. Do you understand the reality of that, you guys? That, that we had this debt that was going to be worthy of eternal punishment, and God wiped it out. We were a negative balance on the ledger, and God brought it to zero. He reconciled us to himself through Christ, and then he turned around and he said, don't stop there. Look what he says. He, and he gave us the ministry of bringing other people's balances to zero. That now we actually, he said, look, I don't, I'm not just bringing your balance to zero, but I'm actually giving you the power to do this stuff for other people. That if you're a child of God in this room, please hear me. If you are a Christian, a follower of Jesus, you have no right to be offended at people, to hate people, to be angry at them, to be holding on to bitterness. You got no right at all. What's been done for you to bring your balance to zero? God said, now I want you to bring other people's balances to zero. I did it for you so that you can do it for them. That he himself, he himself through Christ, he gave us this ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation, that we now have this message. God didn't just give it to you and do it for you. He's entrusted it to you. That way other people would look at you and the way that you love and the way that you forgive and the way that you show grace, the way that you just cancel the record of wrong that people have against you. And they go, what in the world is that about? You say, this is what God did for me and I'm doing it for you. I forgive you, man. Hey, you don't have to, it's, it's I forgive you. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. This is the gospel, you guys. That, that even if they don't come to the table, even if you never get along, even if whoever it is in your life that you pointed the finger at and you said, well, no, you don't understand. And I get you've probably been through some stuff. This is the ministry that God has entrusted to you that you would not hold any balance of any offense, of any hurt, of any wrong that someone did to you, but that God would make an appeal through that offense. God would make an appeal through the hurt that you've experienced, that it would be God making an appeal through you, that when you bring that balance to zero, you're showing what God can do. This is what God did for me. And the only reason why I could do it for you is because he did it for me. 
I know this is hard. This is hard because what's, what's robbing a lot of our peace oftentimes, I believe it's, it's people in our life. The enemy will use people to just distract us and divide us and to steal our joy and steal our peace. And, and there is a perfect peace that is available regardless if people ever get their act together. If people ever agree with you. Let me give you the last one. This one's the hardest one. I got to hurry. I got to hurry. Last one. Go first. Go first. One of the unique things that Jesus did for you and me was he didn't wait to see if me and you were going to play ball with him. He didn't wait for you and me to like see if we were going to like, you know, accept it. No, no, no. He just settled it. He just settled it. He goes, no, 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 come now, let's settle this. I've already made up my mind. Here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to cancel the record. I'm going to wipe out the debt. This is settled in my mind. It's yours if you want it. So, so God did not call. He didn't wait to see how we would respond. And you got to stop waiting to see how they will respond and if they will change and if they will just do this. What you need to do is just go first. Go first. Romans 5 and 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still messed up, cursing him, doing our own thing, spitting in his face, rebelling against God, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's amazing. Are you listening today, church? That's amazing. And I know this is challenging, but I want you to see what God did for you. And because he did it for you, and if you can grasp what he really did for you, it will enlarge your capacity to do it for others. Let's go back to James chapter 3. Pick up at verse 17. It says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven, like, is contradictory, right, from the, from the wisdom of the world. The wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Then he tells us how. Peacemakers who, what? Who sow? We go first, man. We're going to sow that. We're going we're gonna to take the first step. We're, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to come and, and, and ask for it. No, no, no. I'm going to sow in peace. And because of that, I'm going to raise a harvest of righteousness. Now, here's what I don't want you to do with this kind of message, you guys. Here's because Some of you might be here today, and you know some, some people that have been just pushing certain buttons and robbing you of joy and peace. And, and what you may be waiting for, you may be waiting to like feel grace, love, mercy. You may, you may be waiting like, I just don't feel like it. But here's what I'm, I'm just going to be very clear of what I'm asking, what I believe God is asking of you today. I'm not asking you to feel it. I'm asking you to do it. You don't have to feel it. You don't, you don't have to feel this to obey God, to do it. You don't. In fact, choices lead and your feelings follow. Stop letting your feelings call the shot. It's actually what's robbing your peace. Actually, it has nothing to do, and I know what they did, and I know who, like, what happened. Like, I'm sure you got all these kind of reasons, but, 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 there is for you available a peace that does not depend on what they do or don't do, what they say or don't say. And you gotta stop waiting for a feeling you need to do it by faith. I'd love to help you make that decision today, that today you'd leave here free. You'd leave here with peace. Like no matter what happens when the family gathering or when you go back to work or when like, like, like even if <laughs> you still have peace. Can I pray that over you with every head bowed, every eye closed in this place? Some of you are here today and you're, you're, in that progression, you know, that, that progression of conflict, maybe you're at the distant stage where there's just some thoughts and ideas and attitudes. You're starting to distance yourself. You could be already building up walls and maybe already at that place of hostility, man, and believing things. And I just have been praying for you all week that, that the light of God's word would expose darkness, expose lie, expose exaggeration, and that his love, a revelation of his love and forgiveness would, would pay the way for you, would pave a way for, for you to make a, a choice today, not to feel something different about them, but to choose to go first, get your peace back, forgive. 
Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.